Namaste. Hi, I'm Bruce Benefield, also known as Zendor. Welcome to One World. Welcome to this edition of One World. In this edition, we've got some special guests with us from the Eternal Flame Foundation, the founders actually, uh, Charles Brown, Russell Stroll, and Bernadine Brown also. And I'd like to introduce them in just a moment, but first I'd like to give a little uh, introduction further to them anyway. And that is, with the Flame Foundation, what they have come together upon is a belief that they have in actually being physically immortal. Now, if we can look at the uh, modern as well as ancient scriptures, I think that we can find the underlying tones in all of them for the indications that those are indeed, uh, or that is indeed, possible. So with that, I'll introduce them now. Welcome to the show. Thank Charles. you, Hi. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Nice being here with you. Um, I hope that that was appropriate. I, I feel sure. that, that it is Absolutely. worthy of giving a little foundation for that because there there is a lot of information that's in, uh, right. in all the literature as you've studied and I think that's part of what enabled you to come to what you're uh, aware of. Bernadine, though, beginning with you, what got you started? What prompted you to believe and to know, as you say, that there is physical immortality and that you are in practicing that. Right. Uh, I had a deep desire to live and I heard of an individual uh, saying that the physical body didn't have to die and when I heard that it was like that's the sound of me. It's like I, I, I finally heard something that gave me a real purpose for being on the planet. Now, correct me if I'm wrong but I believe in the King James Version of the Bible that we use. I believe in the, I did some research on my own. In the ninth <laughs> chapter of the book of John, Jesus is talking to his disciples or something. He says, Verily, verily, truly, I say to thee, if you shall follow my words, you shall never taste death, right. or not taste death, or something like that. Right. Now, yeah. that, you know, when I was a little kid, I felt that resonate with me, um, not knowing of, of how, how to, you know, it, it did, uh, like, yeah. it resonate. Yeah, amazingly. What got you in? Amazingly, in Bruce. Yeah. Well, in, in, uh, to coincide with what you're, you were just uh, expressing, uh, yeah, St. John 9, 51, 52, it says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Well, the religious structures, especially that which I came up to as a child, taught that, well, that was for the spiritual uh, person, the spiritual man, the inner man. But uh, when I awakened, which was uh, uh, in the spring of 1960, almost 32 years ago, mm -hmm. I wasn't searching for physical immortality. However, I had, I, after my awakening, I remember asking my mother particular questions as a child, you know. One in particular was, uh, why do we have to die? In other words, if if God can take care of so many things, and if God can even heal people of incurable diseases, which we'd heard of, I says, well, Mom, why can't he keep them alive? And she says, oh, well, honey, that'd be wonderful, but it's appointed unto man to die. So in... Uh, it's his choice. It is choice. Mm -hmm. But it was in, in light of that, of what you expressed earlier, they take verses out of context. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when, when Jesus quoted that, if he was merely speaking of the spirit or, or inner man, then it would not have, in the next verse, they, they said unto him, now we know that you have a devil, because Abraham is dead, 
right. and the prophets, yet you tell us if we keep your sayings, we'll never taste of death. Who do you make yourself? So in that light, uh, he was speaking of the physicality of the body, body. And of course, in that, actually my first awakening, uh, which was, I term, a real cellular awakening, and it's like a new intelligence just began to flood throughout my body. I couldn't turn it on and off, which a belief system or a philosophy, you can turn on and off at will. And this that was happening, I couldn't. It's like, Day and it's like throwing your truth on a chopping block and whacking away at it. Right. It still stands, no That's matter right. what you do. Right. That's right. Yeah. After yeah. 32 years, I'm stronger than ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. James, what got you started? Had well, Bruce, I've always been interested in being totally alive and being around people that are alive. And I can remember from a small uh, child, you know, um, I asked my parents one time, I said, why do we have to die to go to heaven? You know, why can't we have heaven here on earth? You know, why can't we, this is just about, I think I was around 12 years old when I asked this question. And uh, of course, my first thing my mother said was, well, it sounds good. You know, it sounds like it would really be wonderful because we could all be together and people would be alive here and, you know, uh, but it's just, uh, it's not the way it's supposed to be. That's the only answer she knew to give me. You know, but I always searched uh, for, I searched for more. Um, I wanted more uh, from, ever since I can remember, I wanted more out of life. And so that's what physical immortality is about to me. Uh, being totally alive. It's a quality of living. Not, I mean, who wants to live in some right. decrepit state or, right. or to some depressed state? So uh, physical immortality is being totally alive. And uh, that's something that uh, you can't uh, stereotype, you know, uh, you can't just get a belief about uh, or create a philosophy about because that's where we start making rules about how to be alive then. Yeah. Being alive, there's, there's, living there's living, no... There's, there's really right. no way to, that's right. to distinguish. Right. Exactly. Do it. Exactly. There's no, uh, you know, uh, rules as such other than, you know, really uh, determining or making a personal decision for me that I'm going to be here forever with other people who want to be here forever. You might say it's the collective energy of moving together. Uh, right. you, know, you, you talk a lot about creating one world. Wow. Uh, I think uh, again, unless there's a condition here that we begin to clean up, and that's the human condition, you know, uh, we'll never clean up this, the, uh, the conditions in the world today that are plaguing us uh, as far as pollutions and everything and that's gone on. It's not a chicken or, or the egg kind of scenario now. Right. We really have to take a look at, at what's going on with us. And, and right. Chuck, with, with your comments about um, what Christ was talking about, you know, it seems to me anyway, that when there was a distinction between the spirit and the body, he made it in every reference that, it, that he made. And I think that that is true in, the, uh, in all the other right. scriptural information. The thing that, no. yeah, what, what, what amazed me is how this uh, facet is overlooked that he did teach physical immortality. I was not aware, however, and uh, even in uh, school, theological school, I, I was not aware that he taught physical immortality. Somehow you miss these points because you're, you're programmed that it is speaking for the spiritual world or the spiritual life. But the spiritual world or life was always uh, immortal in that sense. So he had to be speaking of the physicality of the human body. And of course we see it much deeper today ourselves. Uh, we feel that he was merely preparing the way for because sure, uh, they had not the understanding at that's that That's right. And mm -hmm. he, he had to speak in parables and symbols. They didn't understand. He did and talk about the spirit and the body becoming one. That's though, right. That's right. Absolutely. Like that's right. the soul that's right. as we know it. Absolutely. That's what the purpose is. To us, there's, a, there's an integration of body, soul, and spirit. And one without the other is, is incomplete. Right. And that's why a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, he was speaking of just the soul or the spiritual aspect. But Paul brought it all together when he said, I pray, God, that your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved unto the coming of the Lord, which he, to us, it's the manifestation of life. That is the Lord, the coming forth totally of that in every cell and atom of your body. So it's quite exciting. <laughs> now, for myself, in realizing that the idea of immortality as a child, I realized same time that I couldn't really talk about it a whole lot. It was just a, a belief that I kept, yes. didn't discard. However, when I did talk about it, it, it set up some fears in other mm -hmm. people and, and things like that. No doubt you've gone through some fears and overcome them. 
-hmm. What was your greatest fear and, and how did you overcome it? I don't think that I experienced a fear with it. I, I know I didn't. It's not a matter that I don't think. I never experienced the fear of being um, rejected by people for really being alive. It was like, for me, it was my salvation. When, when I experienced physical immortality, it was my salvation. It was, it was wonderful for me. And even though my family, my father who's a minister, and my family, uh, they all think I'm a little strange <coughs> to feel that I can stay here forever with other peoples like myself. But I never looked back. Once I experienced being physically immortal, I never looked back. It was always straight ahead. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm looking straight ahead. And uh, what I experienced in the past, uh, before uh, waking up, mm -hmm. that the body really is so wonderful that it really can stay here forever, before I experienced that, I was, I was raised uh, in religion, and I uh, experienced some wonderful things there. And so for me, it's like I didn't give up anything. Yeah. I really fulfilled every, every phase of that and I just went on. It's like I just went on from there. It was a wonderful, for me, uh, a wonderful beginning. Um, it's a lot like what I experienced too, Bruce. Uh, I had a lot of fears, um, I think like a lot of people. Uh, I had a lot of deep feelings. Um, I felt um, a lot of ideas that I w wanted to instrument, but I felt fears in doing doing so that I would be rejected. But when I really uh, experienced, when I experienced that I didn't have to die, mm -hmm. and I met other people is a key thing, and I met other people who, were, who felt that way too, there was a connection that wiped away a lot of those fears for me. I mean, there was a time that I would experience, I, I've expressed this at different times and even some of our events we have, there was times I used to experience a melancholy uh, weekly, maybe, in my own person. That uh, and I and I identified it with uh, one of my heroes was uh, a Abraham Lincoln, you know, because he had such a feeling of integration and bringing people together and everything. This is what I identified with, you know. And how many times did he fail? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Did, but he experienced, and I read a lot of his biog biographies when I was a kid. A lot of story, anything I get my hands on about him. And uh, this is also why, you know, I was interested in Sri Aurobindo because he was like the Abraham Lincoln of India. Right. But I talked to you about that earlier. And, uh, but uh, I. You know, Abraham Lincoln, for example, he experienced also a lot of depression because he felt like uh, he would, wouldn't be really received, that, and he had so many deep feelings, you know. Uh, this is my, in, in reading about him, that he experienced. He felt anxieties in him and experienced his melancholy every, you know, uh, very often. And so I identified with that, you know, and I experienced sure. these melancholies, and I experienced, you know, like, where am I going to go with all these feelings? But when I, uh, well, I went and met Charles and Bernie, and they were speaking um, in 1968 when I first saw them speak. They were saying, hey, you don't have to evolve anymore uh, to, uh, uh, to come to a living, to really be alive. You can live right now. The choice is right now. Physical immortality is right now. If you can't accept it now, you never will be good enough. Never have. You know, and this is the whole thing. I, I was in this process still thinking, well, maybe, I, maybe I'll have to go through another a life. Um, maybe I'll have to reincarnate again, because at that time I was in, involved in integral yoga. Mm -hmm. And Sri Aurobindo was teaching, you know, that um, you, uh, to cr he wanted to create a super body to master super consciousness, but he couldn't get cooperation with, with the other yogis in, in India because everybody was competing with each other who had the most enlightenment, you know. And so, but when I met them and they were, and they were speaking, you know, uh, physical mortality now that struck me and from that time on I this mel that melancholy left it's like yeah, I had a direction for my life a, a death the fear of death ended in me mm -hmm. actually more than that the fear of being alive yeah that ended that's in me a I lot of people fear of being I think alive. that's a very key point yeah yes. a lot of people in today's society it's not a fear of failure it's a fear of success. Exactly. Yeah. Fear of being that's totally alive. them from doing and from that's stepping right. out. Right. That's we right. get people say, well, you guys, you know, you're especially about immortality, not dying. You're just, you're just afraid of dying. And I said, really, I said, we've had to face that. We've had to look, we've had to look mm -hmm. death right in the eye. Really, the reality is, is most people are afraid of really living. Absolutely. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Now, on a, the common human experience, most of, at least when you begin to intellectualize uh, about physical immortality, um, at least myself, I initially began thinking about the psycho-spiritual and scientific technologies right. that would have to evolve or, or at least become present mm -hmm. in your understanding. 
how have you dealt with that? What have you been able to, to bring together? Well, amazingly, when <coughs> the time that uh, I began to awaken in the 60s, we began to discover that much was uh, taking place in the field of gerontology, in the study of the aging process. And uh, also then, of course, you had individuals like uh, uh, Ettinger who wrote uh, The Prospect of Immortality. But he was coming from the place of cryonics, the freezing of the body mm -hmm. and then reanimating in the future, some future generation. Cloning. That, yeah, cloning, <laughs> all of this. But to me, that was no different than uh, uh, the religious teaching of the resurrection. There's always some day. And so here, uh, uh, individuals are paying thousands of dollars to make sure that their body is frozen and on, in the hope that someday science will perfect uh, uh, a cure. Uh, for the disease that took them and then they can be reanimated. Uh, all of that was wonderful, but again, as I said, it was a hope. Uh, also, we began to see that other scientists were making tremendous inroads. Uh, one actually spoke in the 60s very strongly about physical immortality, and his name eludes me right now, perhaps it'll come to me. But in one uh, press release, he expressed that within a very short time, that human beings would be living to 120, uh, that they were right now unlocking the genetic code, that which is locked in the DNA, and um, that aging was there, and if they, uh, the secret of aging was locked in, and if they could release that, then human beings could live to be 120, 150, 200, mm -hmm. and he said, if we can take it that far, we can take it to infinity. Oh, okay. And okay. so human beings have the potential of being immort uh, immortal. Then, amazingly, in the 70s, 10, 15 years later from this statement, he, came, he comes forth with another statement, press release, and he said, we have already extended life to the point that it, it is now bankrupting our social security system. So, because of this, human beings are not ready for immortality. So, you see, uh, human beings in the death program, they are programmed to serve systems rather than realizing that systems are to be serving human beings. Exactly. So they should be shifted. The Social Security should sh uh, shift mm -hmm. in order to serve human beings. But uh, what I want to say, what we're doing now, we have doctors and scientists who are now involved with us who are actually probing into, these, into the depths, not viewing in the laboratory the physical body as though it were some foreign object that the spiritual entity is living within and therefore it's foreign matter. We're getting in touch with that they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. And viewing from that place, uh, tremendous things are happening. At our uh, uh, international conference recently in Scottsdale, Arizona, we had over 600 people from around the world. We had one day where doctors and scientists uh, uh, can, uh, they spoke one day uh, bringing about all the advances that are taking place in the scientific community. It seems to me that, speaking scientifically, if we've got 10% of our brains that we use, <laughs> okay, yeah. with five senses, I think we all realize that we've got more than that, but just as a ratio, uh, yeah. just for exploration, with 90% of our brain left untapped, is it possible That's we could right. have 54 senses associated with that. I think that that, I mean, that's a loose ratio, yeah. but I think that it's probably much I, more than that. Yeah, I, now, I, multiculturally, yeah. how do you see that? Uh, your organization has spread around the world. How do you see a multicultural experience happening with the idea of physical immortality? Well, mm. uh, I'm sure they'll have more to express on yeah. this. You want to express now, yeah. in that you speak of the brain uh, using merely only 10% of the brain. Uh, to us, the brain is the transmitter of mind, which we are mind all over. Every cell has uh, uh, an intelligence of its own. It has its, it's a universe in itself, really. Right. Uh, so the signals are being transmitted to the brain in order for the brain to transmit the knowledge of the language of the body. However, if the body itself is not awake, and this is what we term there must be a total cellular awakening, Bruce, 
And in that happening, the cells of the body begin to transmit to the brain and begin to open the brain cells. But if the body isn't awake, it doesn't do any good for the brain to be open. And that's the portion we feel yeah. that is locked in for human beings to begin to awaken on a cellular level to physical immortality. Then you begin to see the brain cells begin to open and human beings begin to use that percentage. Yeah, I and want to say something here. Yeah. That I, I feel that it has to go past the individual self. Yeah. Our intellect mm -hmm. has to, the, the power of the, of the brain, group mind, uh, yeah. yeah, has intellect. to go past the individual self. And that's where uh, coming in contact with people all over the world and all of us joining together, one body right. on this planet is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Then we stir each other intellectually that's in a way right. that we've never stirred before. Right. And we experience uh, the mind all over that Chuck is talking about. Uh, it's, it's so exciting because we, we begin to tap into one another. We, we excite one another to the point that we come up with that which we've never dreamed possible. New technologies, yeah. creative endeavors, yeah. and right. truly one world. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's right. And, and uh, there's a lot of people throughout the world who believe <coughs> in physical mortality. Yeah. But it's got to go past the belief. Mm. There's a lot of people who want to change the world in one way or another that they feel would make it better, but they, right. they, they feel, they have a feeling about it, but they never activate it, you know. Uh, what we're about is activating what we are. We are moving in every way we can. We've written a book about it uh, called T Together Forever. That's right. Yeah. I think you have I it there. Have book. <laughs> <laughs> Together forever. And, and we'll uh, have an 800 number also yes. for you guys in just a little bit. Great. Great. Well, this is where we're, we're using every uh, technique and, and uh, moving, moving in every way that we can to integrate people, to bring people together who, uh, who feel, uh, who really want to improve their lives in a way, in a deathless way. Mm -hmm. in the, the ultimate way, uh, ending death totally. And I think uh, there's a lot of people who have, like I said, feelings about this, but mm -hmm. they haven't known what to do with it. And this is what we're about, is touching people, uh, w awakening them to want to uh, unite uh, in a way like we've never had before to end the sentence of death. And, that's, mm -hmm. and I call it a sentence. I think that's very important. Yeah. Uh, I think people basically uh, are yeah, asleep and are on death roll. You know, uh, there's a lot of people I've talked to, and they say, well, I don't believe in capital punishment. I said, well, then step up. I said, do you believe that you have to die someday? They well, say, yeah, well, yes. Yeah, I said, well, what sin have you committed, or what have you done that you think you have to die, or who told you you had to to believe in this? They there say, well, my grandfather died. Somewhere. Right? That's right. <laughs> my mother died. My, you know, so everybody's been dying. You know, well, so what? I mean, well, get, uh, you know, we're out role. to encourage people yeah. to step out of line, right. uh, uh, step out of the, the, the death row. And... Uh, you know, at the same time, we're not out to try to convince anybody. I think this is important to convince them to be physically immortal. That's right. You know, you can't. Uh, no, it's either no. they not. realize it or they don't. That's and once right. Once they do, it's okay. What do, What do we go? Where do we go? How do we go? Huh. And who do we go oh, with? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So that's, that's right. where it, it becomes then uh, an automatic desire then to create the one world of which uh, you're so familiar with. And that's what uh, we're doing all over the world. We uh, now travel into over 15 countries. Uh, we have uh, conducted seminars. We went in seminars to events, uh, or, or I should say intensives, and then events. Mm -hmm. Now they're events that we conduct, weekend events um, throughout the world. And uh, uh, we have translation in uh, five to six different languages. We have simultaneous translations. And the book is also written in five The book has been five, uh, six uh, different languages. Is now in, uh, available in five different languages. Uh, Spanish, German, Hebrew, English, and I forget the other one. <laughs> French, I think. Okay. Uh, but uh, what we're discovering... We'll get that 800 number up <laughs> on the screen, too, so you guys can have Great. it while we're... Uh, what we're discovering is the oneness is there. The underlying feeling is there that all human beings underneath the programmed of the uh, different cultures that everyone has grown up in. Uh, somehow there is a oneness there. The, the heartbeat is the same in the sense as far as the desire for a better quality of living. But now how to bring this about? And one of the most wonderful things that we've experienced is to see the healing. Some people feel you, you merely get in touch with whatever trauma in your life and you learn to live with it. Now, we're going beyond that. It's like in our um, uh, intensives in uh, 
Germany and Israel, there's been such a healing between the Germans and the Israelis and bringing them uh, together. Now in our intensives in Israel, we there in the Arab world, we've been moving. And by the way, uh, we like to feel that we've had something to do in what's <laughs> happening be, uh, on the planet right now and the peace sure. that's happening because yeah. uh, right after we moved in Germany, then the wall came down. Uh, we had uh, people from Russia in our, in our intensive in uh, uh, London, who uh, were wanting us so desperately to come to Russia, now things the wheels are turning for that to take place. So and you do see the barriers, oh, uh, and yeah. walls, yeah. and, and, the and to see what is down. happening now in the Arab world, that uh, uh, many of the Arabs now are beginning to come into the group uh, in Israel, and uh, it's really exciting. But to see, even as we experience the Jews and the Germans holding each other, weeping, uh, washing away the scar tissue yeah. of what happened, you know, the tremendous animosity that could remain there forever. And that's what it's been for centuries, mm -hmm. is human beings uh, retaining the hurt of what has happened, either in their own life or past lives and so forth. But now it's, being, it's all being healed. So it's truly, it is true that we can have heaven on earth. And karmic laws can be wiped away. Original sin consciousness can be wiped away to where human beings can be one on this planet and we truly can create heaven here on earth with one another. Agreed. Great. <laughs> <laughs> We've got just a little bit of time left. James, can you give our audience some practical advice on what they can do in their own lives on a daily basis? Yeah, great. I'm glad you asked that, Bruce. Uh, I was talking a little earlier about how someone can believe in something, you mm -hmm. know, and but unless that belief, to me, is taken beyond, you know, just the believing in, yeah, then it, it, it falls flat. And, and we never, an individual never can really consummate uh, all the visions they see of a better life, uh, much less a better world. Okay. And so, uh, first of all, you know, I would like to say that it's important to believe in physical mortality, okay? But at the same time, uh, then beyond that is making a connection with other people, with yeah. other individuals who feel that too, who encourage them to live. And so that's what uh, the main thing right now that I can tell anybody is to make that connection with other people. We're available. You'll see our 800 number. There's right. people throughout the world. Okay, great. Thank you all for being part all of right. the show. And yeah. things went so fast that, you know, yeah, yeah, it's really. more time. Thank you. There's never enough time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. And thank you all for watching. The Flames... 800 number, if we can get that up on the screen now, is 1-800-423-4404. And their book, Together Forever, you can inquire about that and more activities of what the uh, Flame Foundation can do for you. And I'm Bruce Benefield, also known as Zendor, asking you, our viewers, to give us a call, drop us a note. You can either call us at 602-264-0986 with your comments or what you'd like to see on the show, or how we can help you. Or drop us a line, Care of One World, P.O. Box 32035, Phoenix, Arizona, 85064. Again, thanks so much for watching. I'm Bruce Benefield. Namaste.